The black is actually the force trajectory that the subject traced out at the time. Note that it's trapezoidal in shape. That is, it increases linearly with respect to time, it sustains the target force level, and then decreases again. As I mentioned earlier, what we're interested in is the relationship between the improvement threshold of these mill units, shown here on the force profile for the first mill unit, and their firing rates. In this case, we'll look at the example of the mean firing rate, which is calculated as a regression over the period of constant force. When we plot these two pieces of information for a mill unit in the firing rate improvement threshold plane, we get a data point. When we do this for all of the mill units in the contraction, we get a relationship. Past studies have indicated what we see here. It is an inverse linear relationship between the mean firing rates and the recruitment thresholds of motor units in contraction, which we call the uninstant phenomenon. We call it this because when we plot their instantaneous firing rates as a function of time, as per the plot on the left, they appear stacked sequentially like the layers of the map. In this study, I also will be showing the relationship between the initial firing rate of these motor units and the recruitment thresholds, where the initial firing rate is the instantaneous firing rate at the point of recruitment. So all the results we see throughout this are going to follow this, this a diagram that we see here on the right, where we see both the initial firing rate recruitment threshold relationship and the mean firing rate recruitment threshold relationship for all the low units in each contraction. So I recruited six subjects, three male, three female, approximately the same age and physical capabilities, all of whom understood and signed an informed consent form prior to participation in the study. I decided to study three different muscles, again, to characterize how different that behavior is from muscles of different purposes. One is the vastus lateralis, or VL, which is a large muscle in the quadriceps, indicative of sustained postural control. The second is the first dorsal interosseus, or FDI. It's a small muscle in the hand that performs abduction of the index finger, indicative of finer motor control. And the tibialis anterior, which is a muscle on the front of your shin that performs dorsal flexion of the foot, indicative also of postural control, but should show some differences between the TA and the VL, as it is a smaller muscle. I asked the subjects to perform isometric contractions of each of these three muscles using a test chair developed at the NRC shown on the right. This chair immobilizes the joints necessary for the isometric contractions, records the subject's force output with respect to time, records and stores the EMG data for later decomposition, and provides live feedback to the subject as far as they can get. To normalize behavior between subjects, as everyone's capable of different force level outputs, we use something called the Maximum Voluntary Contraction, or MVC. The MVC is the highest absolute force level that a subject can sustain with a given muscle for a very short period of time. And all subsequent contractions are measured as percentages with respect to this MVC. So for this protocol, again, trying to look at that behavior as it varies also with force level, I asked the subjects to perform contractions at 20, 50, 80, and 100% of this MVC level using that trapezoidal force paradigm that we showed in the earlier example. The result of six subjects performing four contractions of three different muscles is over a thousand more units decomposed at 85% accuracy or better, a property measured by the algorithm itself. And again, when we look at the results, we'll be seeing first the intra-subject variability and then the inter-subject variability. So here we see a plot of the vastus lateralis behavior of a particular subject. In this plot, the dotted regressions indicate the initial firing rate versus recruitment threshold relationship and the solid regressions indicate the mean firing rate versus recruitment threshold relationship. Colors indicate the level of the force contraction. That is, the two blue regressions show the 20% MVC behavior, the two green regressions show 50%, orange 80%, and red 100%. I plot them this way so you can sort of see the dynamic behavior of the subject at the time. So for example, in the 20% contraction, we see that the first modia that we observe is recruited near eight pulses per second. That's the first hollow blue data point. And then when the subject reached and sustained that target 20% MVC force level, that same mode unit was shown to have a firing rate just under 20 pulses per second. So each mode unit is plotted in two places, one in the initial firing rate plot and one in the mean firing rate plot. First thing to note here is that we see more mode units recruited as the force level increases. You can tell that because we see them recruited at higher recruitment thresholds as the force level increases, although we are unable to resolve the behavior of lower threshold mode units as the, these contractions tend to get very complex and high in amplitude. We also see their firing rates increase with increasing force as evidenced by the increasing intercept of the mean firing rate regressions. Interestingly, the slope in both the mean firing rate and the initial firing rate regressions appears to be pretty consistent for this particular subject. I've given the coefficients of determination, or R-squared values, for the mean firing rate regressions in the top right corner. These values are very high for biological data, and they indicate very strong statistical correlation, much higher than we typically see in this kind of data. Here's the FDI behavior in 